you can be in San Francisco and you have incredibly high rents with no availability. You can go out to the suburbs and it's incredibly expensive and no availability. You can come out 50 miles away and it's incredibly expensive and there's no availability. It's not a local problem. It's actually everything from San Diego up, up, to, the, up to the Canadian border, basically. Anything along this strip of coast is expensive. You know, I always compare it to squeezing a balloon. Like, all the little tricks that people do, like, oh, I'll just move a little bit farther out, or I'll get a slightly smaller place, or I'll, I'll live in a slightly less desirable, those things have been done for 30 years. And we're sort of at the point where there just aren't any more, there's no wiggle room in the system, there's no slack. So, the other way that you can solve these problems is by going under the radar and not mentioning it to the authorities and doing things that your neighbors will accommodate. And if you look around this neighborhood, every one of these houses has a workaround. Everyone has neighbors and friends and coworkers and relatives that they want to house, and they're taking them in. They're not creating um, an illegal situation, but they're definitely finding creative workarounds. When you have a 700 square foot house and you want to make it bigger, and you don't want to spend a lot of money, you have to get creative. If you go to the authorities and you ask for permission to put on one more bedroom and one more bathroom or maybe make the space a little bit bigger, you're looking at $60,000 just in permits and papers and stamps from the county. So I decided to figure out what I'm allowed to do legally without permits, without interacting with the authorities that kind of got most of what I needed without breaking the law and without borrowing money. The first element was this garden shed. And it gave us the equivalent of a third bedroom. It's, it's not really a, a bedroom. Legally, you can't live in a shed, but nobody does live in it. It's an overflow space. Um, I'm gonna put my shoes back on, okay? You're gonna put your shoes back on? Um. So you can have guests here. It's a home office, a place for the kids to hang out. See, this is why the place is messy, because we've got all this cuteness going on. It just came in, in panels, which came in a kit. They bolted together in a weekend. Now, I did other things to make that nicer. I put in insulation. I, uh, I spent a few months tinkering with it, finishing the interior, uh, putting in a wood floor. You know, I put in a brand new mattress. It came in the mail in a big tube. It was kind of fun. I, the bed frame is from Craigslist. None of this is super fabulous. And when you have little kids and a big dog, like nothing actually stays pristine for very long. And again, at this price point, it's okay. It was, I think, a $4,500 kit. And then we probably spent another 4,000 or so. So call it $9,000 all in, give or take. Which seems like a lot of money, but compared to $60,000 in paperwork to get permission to build a bigger thing, and then you have to pay for the bigger thing. This was cheap, it was fast, it was easy. Lots of people have come here and spent a night or two. Maybe legally you're not allowed to sleep in a shed exactly, but you know it's not the same as renting a place out. I won't do anything that uh, makes me liable as a landlord. Like I wouldn't build something and rent it out, but nobody does live here. It's just a little extra space for the family who lives in the main house. 700 square feet, so living room, walk-in, kitchen, if you blink, you might miss the whole house. Bedroom one, bedroom two, which is the kids right now, and then the bathroom, and that's it. So we've got two kids, a dog, my husband and I. So that for you to work. Yeah, I, I could sit in here and work if I wanted to, or, but with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, they always want to hang out with mom. So I go into Slack Haven. Johnny had this shack already created by the time we, um, we showed up, which was awesome. You know, he said, well, there's this other kind of thing in the back. We call it Slack Haven. You can kind of use it for whatever you want. It's off grid, so there's no real electricity going to it. The lights that are in here are um, USBs and they are battery packs. So we plug them in and there you go. You've got your light, your little lantern, and this will last you 
a week or so just with that one simple battery pack and as and when we need it we bring those in and we'll recharge them it's actually insulated so not only is it finished really nicely on the inside but it's super insulated as well so it's the biggest size shed you can have without a permit i think it's 10 by 12 which is a fair size it's the size of a bedroom you know you can recreate in it legally which is all we do nobody's living in it if you wanted to sleep there if you have a guest you absolutely can and that's exactly what we use it for you can have as many of these sheds as you want in your home according to the rules and regulations but there are parameters there's the side setbacks the front and rear setbacks from the property line it can't be more than 12 feet tall this is not it can't be more than 120 square feet no electricity no plumbing and if I want more sheds, I can have as many as I want as long as they're 50 feet apart from each other. So I'm putting another one over there that's more than 50 feet. I could put another one in each corner in the back of the lot. And I think there's room over there in the front side yard, as long as I stay within the limits, that I could have one. Now, I'm not probably not going to have five sheds, but I could legally. So it's knowing the rules well enough to know how to not break them. And over here, we have an outdoor sink. Now, you can't put a sink outside if it's got actual pipes, because then there's permits and there's inspections and there's regulations, but it's a garden hose. I mean, it's just a garden hose, right? That goes into this temporary potting shed. It's a tin bucket and it's a spigot. Now, if this were a pipe instead of a garden hose, I'd be in big trouble, but it's a garden hose. It, there's no law against having a garden hose in your backyard yet. We're waiting for them to catch on, but so far so good. And it's, it's all portable and temporary. And we use biodegradable camp soap so that it's not gonna hurt the plants. And when it drains, it goes into a little bucket and it actually waters and we can direct that wastewater anywhere we want. Now, we're also putting in an outdoor shower. Now, again, if I ran a pipe out to any part of the yard and put a shower head on it and called it an outdoor shower, I'd be in big trouble. All kinds of environmental rules have been violated. Raw sewage will be released into the environment. Really, it's just a garden hose with, an, with a shower head in a little screened in area for privacy. And that's not against the law. Legally, you can't just build a house in your backyard. You can't have a kitchen, it can't have a bathroom, it can't have electricity, it can't have a heater, and air, none of that is legal. There are processes that will allow you to do that legally, but it is unbelievably complex and hideously expensive. I mean, the bare minimum is gonna be $200,000. So nobody can sleep in here? Technically, I suppose if somebody from the county showed up looking for a problem, they could say you can't sleep in it. But does that mean you can't spend the night in it? As like when relatives come for a week, they could probably say you can't do that. It's unlikely that they're going to do that. Now, if I decided to have a renter here and they were living in this place, that would be a problem. A lot of it has to do with what your neighbors will tolerate. On the like pushing the spectrum of what's tolerable, people who are the pioneers of yeah, I don't want to be a pioneer. I, I tried being a pioneer and it doesn't really work because everybody in society pushes back. Uh, what I, so here's, here is how I describe it. I, I'm, I am the rodent. I am the, the little, little fuzzy rodent scurrying around in the dark corners trying to figure out like where are the opportunities that other people don't recognize that are cheap and easy and nobody even notices you're doing it. And if you're found out, nobody can say anything about it. So what we're adding over there is a shed, an actual utility shed, so that we can take all of the stuff that's in the garage and put it in there. And what we'll do is we will semi-finish the garage. The idea is to take as much of this as we can uh, and put it in that shed, get rid of a whole bunch of stuff too, and then we'll not kind of formally officially finish it. It's just kind of semi-finished because if we did want to formally finish it, it would be way more money than it's worth. It would be $400,000. It's still going to be a garage. It's just going to be a more livable garage that can be used for other things, especially in the wintertime when the kids can't be outside in the yard. And I'm probably going to put in a Murphy bed, which means if you had company over at Christmas time, you could put down the queen size bed in the garage with a rug and some furniture and soft lighting. It's still a garage, you know, but it's a usable space. So you're taking a small house and you're making it more functional, not exactly the way you might want it, but in a way that solves your problems at a decent price point. So what I've done here is um, I bought a house at the bottom of the 2008 crash at the bottom of the market, and it wasn't really 
It was barely habitable. It was the worst, smallest, ugliest, most rundown house in Sonoma County. And nobody else wanted it. The banks weren't lending. And I had been saving my money toward this goal for about 10 years. But then I had to spend a year making it livable. Most people, they tend to focus on the surface things like the granite countertops and fancy appliances. And I didn't do any of those things. I put in really good quality windows and I put an enormous amount of insulation in the walls, the ceiling, under the floor. So now in the winter, we don't actually need heat of any kind. And in the summer, you don't need an air conditioner. All we have up here in the, uh, in the vent in the attic is a fan that turns itself on and off with the heat. That fan uses a tenth the amount of electricity as an air conditioner. I put in a really high quality metal roof and that works in the summer to bounce heat off of the house. It also collects rainwater and I've got a big tank in the back. Got heirlooms here. This whole bed is heirlooms, tomatillos, peppers, and this is kind of my tea bed. This is all chamomile that I just cut back. Mint, lemon balm, basil, this is fennel. These are San Marzano's for uh, sauce and then we've got a Eggplant, cherry tomatoes, um, a few different types of eggplant there. In order to get more functionality out of this property without spending an enormous amount of money and going into debt and without breaking any rules, I talked to my tenants and I said, do you want me to spend $400,000 making this the bigger, better home that you really want and have your rent go up by a corresponding amount? And they said, no. I said, okay, I don't wanna go $400,000 in debt as a landlord. So I said, well, what can we do without begging for permission, without taking on debt, that will give you the functionality that you want? The easy thing is you put on a deck. This deck is about the same size as the house. And it's beautiful, and it's a great place to do work. You can eat. So this is a, uh, an Italian manufactured pizza oven. You slide the pizza dough in here so we can make many, many loaves of bread and pizzas. It can burn wood, it could burn propane. And we've had neighbors come over here. We've had dozens of people. And this is still a work in progress. These granite slabs, I got these from a salvage yard in San Francisco. Steve is extremely handy. He's got a good carpenter skill, so he built the wood bases. These are sections, they're modular, so they can be moved, they're mobile, there's nothing permanent about them. Then we have this two burner stove here, it runs on propane, so you can get giant pots of spaghetti sauce. I like to do a lot of home canning, but it doesn't matter how hot it is because you're doing it outdoors, it doesn't heat up the house. There's also this little grill for vegetables and meat outside. Over here, you can make a thousand pancakes or eggs all at once. You know when they have company coming over and they can just make like huge breakfasts and, and dinners and lunches out here. And none of this stuff costs that much money. The plan is to take all of these individual pieces and gradually create a more elegant, more thoughtful arrangement. We've got the outdoor dining room, the outdoor living room, the outdoor kitchen, a shed that functions like a detached bedroom. We have an outdoor sink. And then back over here, this part of the deck was existing. Um, the problem with the deck up here is that you start to get into permits and uh, a lot of uh, structural problems. We got seismic regulations. You got, you got to build things with a certain kind of foundation. So what we did is we fortified what was already here so we didn't have to interact with the county. And we've got this great outdoor living room. It's also a great home office. You'll notice as you walk through my house, you didn't see a TV um, because we don't have a TV. This swing thing, we actually hook a little projector up to plug it into my laptop. And this is a movie screen from an old schoolhouse. So yeah, we'll have a uh, movie night under the stars. <laughs> We're training the vines. These are all grapes. You can see literally we'll have grapes falling on our head. The idea is that if you train them all the way across the top, they'll create the shade for you. In the summer, it does get hot. That's west and the sun in the late afternoon bakes the, the house and you really couldn't be out here in the past. As soon as we built this arbor and we put the, uh, the shade cloth over the top, it meant that it's 100 degrees out there and it's 70 degrees on the deck for the last eight years since I bought the house. I've been planting these fruit trees, vines, and berry bushes. This, this is basically a shade structure that keeps the house cool without air conditioning, and it also produces food. I intentionally planted things that come in early in the season, things that come in late in the season. It's kind of cool to have fresh fruit from the garden in late December. And then you can make jams and jellies, and you can make little gift baskets for the neighbors and burden them with your zucchini all year long.
a lot of people are terrified of the evil like absentee slumlord and I make sure I am never that guy. I made things better. It's much better to rely on a large group of people all, physically all around you than to just assume that you can use a little plastic card at a store and you can get everything you need from life. <laughs> this whole area here was originally one piece of farmland. There was a man named Mr. King. I talked to the older people who still remember him, and he was more or less illiterate. He had escaped the Dust Bowl from Oklahoma, came to California like a lot of people did during the Great Depression in the 1930s. He worked in the sawmill across the street. He pulled together enough money to buy the land, and then after World War II, there was a military base on Mare Island that's closer to San Francisco. And they had all of these barracks and these officers' cottages on Mare Island at the military base. And in the 50s, the government just sold them off. And farmers like Mr. King would come and put them on trucks and bring them here. So these houses, it's hard to tell now because over the decades they've been added onto and expanded. But all of these little homes used to be military barracks and officers' homes. And he plopped them down. I think he paid $100 each for them. So you can see this house. This was another one of those little houses from Mare Island. Technically, these homes were all built in 1941. It was right after Pearl Harbor. And the army got soldiers together to build hundreds of them all at once on a military base. And they were very inexpensive, simple, mass-produced, bang, bang, bang. It was the prototype for Levittown, getting soldiers to build lots of identical homes one after the other. This is actually the, the thing that happened before Levittown. This was military housing that was built in a hurry. So that was what real estate development was like in the 1950s. You could be a semi-literate farmer who worked in a sawmill, who pulled together a little bit of money, bought some existing homes from a military base, and then sort of you know, populated your farm field with it. Today, you can't build a shed without problems with the authorities. I don't really blame the regulations because they all exist for a reason, but now we're sort of paralyzed and there's really no political or cultural process that's gonna allow us to fix that. So, we're not going to fix our problems. We're actually going to be overwhelmed by them, and we're going to deal with the consequences of not fixing things. So that rather than having our problems here resolved by new legislation or new problems, they're just going to crash and burn, and we're going to invent something new someplace else that will work better, and people will go there. That, that's how I think about it. And that process takes decades. There's another thing that's going on. One of our neighbors is living in this uh, mobile home here. They, we had terrible, terrible forest fires here and there were about 7,000 homes that all burned down on the same day. And if you take 7,000 families that suddenly need a new place to live in a, a location where there already aren't any vacancies, you wind up with people living in mobile homes. My neighbors owned this house and they had rented to a young couple. As soon as the relatives were burned out of their house, blood was thicker than water, so they had to ask their renters to leave to make room for family. And so you have people who were evicted for reasonable circumstances, but nobody wanted that to happen, and there was no place for John and Liz to go. People are already leaving the West Coast, and it's not that they want to, it's just, I was in Missoula, Montana, I was in Bozeman, Montana, I've been to all these places around the country, Texas. They're actually receiving the overflow of people who are leaving the West Coast in general. So if people are busy making fun of California for not solving its problems, they're next and they have to get ahead of the curve. This again, this was the same kind of house was from Mr. King, originally built on a military base. And then over the years, garages were added on, front porches were added on, two-story additions were added onto the back. And these all happened incrementally over decades. And every decade that went by, it got a little bit harder and a little bit more expensive to make these changes. It was an accretion. And all of the rules made sense at the time, but there are too many of them now. And peeling them back isn't an option. It's not, it's not possible. There are no easy solutions. There really aren't. Like, when prices go up, a lot of people in town love it. If you already own property, if you're one of the people in the local government, you know, sales taxes go up, property taxes go up, uh, you've got new economic development. All the people who make decisions love it when this happens. Like, the, everyone's complaining about gentrification. People love gentrification. They love it. Unless you don't own property yet, then you don't like it. This house here was also one of the houses that Mr. King brought over from Mare Island. It was about the same size and shape as ours. The problem with this house is that it was so far gone that a bank would not loan a mortgage to it. It wasn't habitable to a bank standards, so they had to pay cash for it. 
So at a certain point, if a house isn't livable, the bank won't lend you a mortgage. So then it's only cash buyers. They paid cash for it and they're fixing it up themselves. They paid about 500,000 for this. And so now they're working hard to make it habitable. So across the street here, this was the old mill where Mr. King worked. Now I think it's a, it's, they do leather work. So it is still a manufacturing concern. And one of the reasons I love this town is that people here still make things. Now you couldn't make money with the lumber yard anymore, but they make high-end leather tools and things. And this used to be the end of the rail line. So back as early as the 1960s, there was passenger rail service that would connect this spot back toward San Francisco, and then you could ultimately catch a ferry boat back to the city into Berkeley and Oakland. The passenger rail service stopped in the 1960s, and the freight rail service stopped in the 80s. But we now have converted that to a uh, bicycle and pedestrian trail. This is the old railroad right-of-way that's been turned into a bicycle and a pedestrian path. You can walk or ride a bike all over the county along this one corridor. So in terms of vulnerability to transportation disruptions, you can live here in a civilized way if you somehow couldn't maintain your car anymore. This area is not that dense. You know? No, it's half acre lots or bigger. When city planners say, look, if you build compact communities where people can walk to the grocery store, where kids can walk to school, because we have a culture where everyone insists on driving everywhere and density is fearful, you know, people panic over the idea that you're going to build a city here. There's a lot of rules and regulations. Starting in the 70s, there was the environmental movement. We don't want to pave over paradise, all that kind of stuff. And so those rules that were meant to preserve open space actually created a situation where everything just continually spread out farther and farther. You could actually build a compact town where you don't need to drive anywhere. As a culture, we just can't wrap our minds around it. I love this building here. Do you want to pop in and talk to the Murphy bed guy? He's, oh my God, you're kidding. Murphy. Yeah. So I, I love this, this company. They make Murphy beds. And I also love the fact that it's a block away. And I'm going to be buying one of these as part of the garage renovation. Hello. These are the beds we build, two different styles. This is the Craftsman style with the false doors, and then this one here is contemporary or no frill style with just the flat panel. They all open the same way. Foot bar here holds the mattress while it's up and the bed off the floor. And then this one is our horizontal, so it's got an extra little piece. Yeah, just so that your pillows don't fall off. And then um, this one has lamps. So this one functions the same way. This one's got one, well, two extra cool features. One, it's got little shelves inside. So you can put your, your water or your book or your wine or chocolate or whatever it is you need. And then the other feature is on the face of this bed. So this one we call our seven door because it's got seven doors. Uh, none of which work as doors. They're all faux doors. The top one is our leg. and they make a table. And then these ones in here are more of the contemporary style. They're gas pistons, so same as on a hatchback car, except for these don't really fail because in hatchback, they get hot and cold and hot and cold and hot and cold. And these ones stay indoors. It'll stay pretty, pretty level and float. I think this one floats right there. And so it's going to hold the strongest when it's all the way up and when it's all the way down. The weight of the bed will hold it down and the strength of the pistons will slam it so it won't fall down. The piston system is a kit, but what we build around it is all our design. So this one's also the same, same idea. Just some rare earth magnets and a couple hinges. This one is super basic. This is the, the most basic. It is just a tiny little bed. Do a lot of people say that they have to make more room because this is the Bay Area, like they have to make small spaces? Yeah, you have to fit into whatever space you have. And if you can triple up on the space. So wait, what is a queen bed is 36, 37 square feet when it's down. And these are nine square feet standing up. So you gain almost 30 square feet. 
So you have to ask yourself, what are the alternatives? You have a small two bedroom house, you have a couple kids. Moving to a bigger house is not an option. So you can leave the state or you can say, okay, how do we take the space that we have and make it work for us? And compared to most other parts of the world, our houses are pretty big. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson raised three daughters in that house. They just put the girls in bunk beds and that was normal in 1952. Now suddenly it's not normal, but you know, the house didn't change, our culture changed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because people want to keep things uh, Respectable. resale, is it resale? It's resale value and it's also, you're trying to filter out unpleasant people. Mm. So there's the same rules that protected homeowners and their property values and prevented change also put those same homeowners in a vulnerable position they no longer have an option because of the rules that they demanded for themselves. These sheds, we're putting the second one in just now. That's been installed just today. This one is just from the Home Depot, big box store. At a certain point, you lose your romanticism about things and you just want to solve problems. And this solves a problem uh, instead of taking months of finishing this off to a high quality standard. This just showed up one day and, and they finished it. And, and I love both of these sheds now. And a lot of the stuff that motivates me, it's not really like I'm trying to save the planet because I don't have the ability to do that. I'm interested in staying out of debt because I don't want to find myself in a foreclosure situation. And I'm not somebody that's ever made a lot of money. So you want to make sure that you have multiple redundancy that you have a supply of water. There's a 5,000 gallon tank out in the backyard that's full of rainwater from the metal roof. Why do we have a vegetable garden? It's not to save money. Food is relatively cheap in the supermarket. It's the experience of having your children out here in the garden with the family. These melons are called brutto ma buono, and that's ugly but good. They're supposed to be super, super sweet. Uh, Italian variety of cantaloupe, so I'm really excited for those. <laughs> the big problem that American society is struggling with right now is that we have a gap between a house as a consumer product, which is supposed to be perfect and you purchase it and it stays the way it is, and property that is actually productive. Do you see the ORAC? It's going crazy! Heat tolerant greens! So a family farm is a productive home. It's a business that makes food, right? The bakery downstairs with the apartment upstairs, mom and pop run the, their home business downstairs and the bakery or the barber shop. Those things are essentially illegal now. They, they really just don't exist. People say, no, we don't want that. We want homeowners association rules and municipal regulations that, that prevent people from doing these things because we only want people to purchase things that are perfect straight away and then we don't want them to ever change. And I think that's the root cause of our economic problems, that you're not allowed to be productive. You're only allowed to go into debt and purchase things.